We are now going to be entertained with our morning's 125th moment. So, shall we do that again? Um, some of you may or may not know that Robin Burns has been the chair of the 125th anniversary committee, which we have been celebrating this entire year. And so she's going to take a few moments to share highlight, another 125th highlight. Once again, we have um, Barb and Bob Seidel um, and Rick King to thank for what you're going to see. Barb and Bob uh, put together the pictures and Rick put it all together with uh, the music. And we've already watched, there's four installments and we've already watched one. Um, this one is the people of the church. Rick?
Well, that's ex- a lot of extreme fun for those of us who were there. Um, for you newer persons, um, the ones of us you recognize, it's probably laughable. Um, but you'll see how we evolve and how times change and how different um, activities come and go and come back. Um, I wanted to say that the when you saw the WCSC, um, which were the women, um, that is what we were before we came, became women's ministries. So we have more of that to come in, in the uh, upcoming months. We, okay. Um, we asked Pastor Mike if he would um, rededicate our house of worship. He is well enough that he can do that and also do uh, our morning prayers. So, Pastor? Lord. 
glory of God and for his purpose. Pray. O oh Lord our God, you are the one who has made the earth and all that is in it. You simply do this by speaking the word, and it is so. You are the one who has put into the hearts and the minds of our forefathers to begin the voluntary church of God some 125 years ago. The Bethel was dedicated in August of that year. So, Lord, we come on this day to dedicate and rededicate. To dedicate ourselves for your purpose and to rededicate this building for your glory. May what be said and done here for an honor and glory to your holy name. May lives be transformed through the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we ask for a fresh breath of your Holy Spirit to rest upon us. To breathe into us again the newness and refreshing nature of life. Give unto us the hope of life, and the hope of life everlasting through Jesus Christ. Lord, we dedicate this building unto you. We dedicate our lives unto your service. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Good morning. It is good to be with you today. Thank you for the invitation to come and, and to share and be a part of your special 125th anniversary uh, celebration. Uh, we, uh, My wife and I were here yesterday and uh, able to enjoy some time at the picnic and appreciate the invitation to come and, and to be a part of that as well. So congratulations on your 125th anniversary. This is actually my third anniversary uh, engagement uh, this summer. It began back in May at the Lancaster First Church of God, our oldest church. They celebrated their 200th anniversary. So you got a ways to go yet to get, get to that one. And then back in July, I was privileged to be at uh, the United Church of God as they celebrated 35 years. And so uh, today, it's good to be with you on your 125th. And when Dr. Walker asked me to preach this Sunday, and it's been a number of months back that you asked me, I, I have to confess that I put it on my calendar and didn't think too much about it. But praise the Lord, Robin sent a letter not too long ago that uh, sparked my uh, rem memory there a little bit, and I thought, oh, that's right, I do have to speak at the end of August at this event. I better be preparing some thoughts. And so I began to pray about that and as I was seeking the Lord's direction on what shall I speak on for the 125th anniversary of the Bowmansdale Church of God, the one passage the Lord kept bringing back to was Philippians chapter 1. 
And uh, that's where we're going to turn in just a moment. But before we turn there, I want to share a story that I think will sort of set the tone for the passage reading and for the message today. I confess that the title of the message today is an anniversary day challenge. That's a horrible message title, and I apologize to Robin for that. And hopefully the message will be better than the title. But I want to share this story, which I think will sort of set the stage for us today. I read a story recently of a pastor who moved to an isolated town of about 10,000 people to a church that was attended by fewer than 75 people. All of his friends said, don't go there. But he went there and he loved the challenge and the church began to grow. Calls to pastor a larger church started coming his way, but he stayed in that community for 10 years. His commitment and competence made a difference. And soon this little church was the talk of the town. New people began attending. The pastor started a a daily radio program at 6 o'clock in the morning that gave people a spiritual jump as they went to work in the morning. In a short time, everyone knew who he was. He became chaplain of two service clubs, and he was invited to speak at civic functions. And he uh, wrote five books on his ministry while he was there during his 10 years. He served as sort of the inspirational role model for younger pastors who were coming along. And when he was asked about his tenure at this rather ordinary place, he laughed and answered, I found a secret here. People in this fine church were waiting for someone to love them, so I did. And they loved me back. Today we're going to look at a love letter. It's a love letter between a pastor and a church. And I think there's some great insights that we can gain from Philippians chapter 1 that will encourage us today and spark us to even greater ministry in the years that are ahead. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi has fascinated Christians for for many, many years. It is a personal letter. Paul writes to a church that He really, really loves. He writes with deep affection to them. In fact, in the span of four chapters of this letter, Paul uses the word joy or rejoice 16 times. He loves this church. This church brings him great joy. And it seems to be, I think, a great place to hear from the Lord on this special day. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn to Philippians chapter 1, we're going to be reading... Beginning with verse 3 through verse 11. Hear now the Word of God. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the Gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word to us today. We thank You for Paul writing this letter to the church at Philippi. And Lord, we sense from Paul the love, the devotion, the joy that the church brought to him. Father, today as we consider the Word, we trust that You'll speak into our hearts and You'll speak into this body of Christ that we would be all that You would have us to be for your honor and for your glory. 
Lord, I'd ask now that you would anoint the words of your servant as he speaks and the hearing of all such that you would be glorified through this act of preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. As Paul opens this letter to the church at Philippi, he begins talking about his partnership in the ministry. Again, this is a church that he had founded, that he had, that he had loved, he had poured time and energy into. This was a people that were very special to him. Now, we often think of Paul as the great apostle, the great apostle to the Gentiles, or Paul as the great church planter. Or if you read the book of Romans, you think of Paul as the great theologian. But Paul was also a pastor. And we get a sense of the pastor's heart when we read Philippians, and in particular in some of these verses here in Philippians chapter 1. Often when we read the New Testament, we read of Paul and, and someone else, that there was someone beside him in the ministry, whether it's Paul and Silas or Paul and, and Barnabas or Paul and Timothy. In fact, you could read the last chapter of the book of Romans, and there are 27 names of people that Paul cites as partners in the ministry. So here is the point, friends, for this anniversary day challenge. The first point is that the ministry of the Bowmansdale Church of God is a partnership. It is not dependent on any one person. It is a partnership. Everybody has a role to play. I was, again, blessed to be here yesterday, and I noticed all the people doing different things, some working games, some working food, some just greeting people as they came in. And there were so many of you who took part in that, giving of your time and talents, the partnership of the ministry. I took time to read through the file that we have in the church office on the Bowmansdale Church of God. And yes, there is a file on you. It's mostly good. Uh, but I read through the lots of articles in there and special bulletins for building dedications and such. And much of your history is documented in that file. I found it very helpful. But what was so interesting for me is the pictures that were in there. That virtually every picture was of a group of people. There was not a picture of a single person. A person by themselves. It's as if we're saying, you know what, we're a part of, of a body that works together, that works in relationship with each other, a partnership, as Paul talks about here in the beginning of this letter. And it shouldn't be that way. Doesn't Paul also refer to the church as the body of Christ with each one doing their part? We all play a part in the body. We work together according to our giftedness to serve the body. Even preparing for this day to day, it has no doubt been a cooperative effort. I was not aware that you had an actual team planning your anniversary celebration for the year. Praise the Lord for that. And again, to see that yesterday, all who are participating, and even the one who gave everything yesterday. Right? The pig. Right? They made the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of the body. We are to use whatever gifts we have to build up the body. And for 125 years, Bowmansdale Church of God, you've been doing that. You have been doing that. That's why Paul says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure you too can say thank you for the partnership in the gospel of the Lord. For 125 years, yes even till today. But Paul goes on to say, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What is Paul saying? Simply this, that God is still at work. That God is still at work. That there's still ministry that has to be done. There's still a mission which is incomplete. There are still lost people all around this Bethel who need to know about Jesus. There are still the least among you who need to be served. The Lord's work for 125 years has been carried out through the Bowmansdale Church of God, but the work is not yet done. And friends, it won't be done until the Lord Himself returns. 
So we keep preaching. We keep teaching. We keep ministering in the name of Jesus. And we keep seeking all till they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, I love the way Richard Stearns, who's president of World Vision, he put it this way in his book, which is entitled Unfinished. Richard Stearns says, God has invited you to join Him in changing the world. He has created you to play an important role in His kingdom vision. You'll never find your deepest purpose in life until you find your place in building God's kingdom. You don't have to go to the Congo. You don't have to go to Uzbekistan to change the world. And you don't have to be brilliant to change the world. You don't have to be wealthy or intellectual or a spiritual giant. But you do have to say yes to the invitation. You do have to be available and be willing to be used. And you may have to pay a price to do so. Following Jesus, changing the world, doesn't come easy. It doesn't come cheap. There will be some sacrifices involved. There always is. I suspect that as you look back over the 125-year history of the Bowmansdale Church of God, there have been some sacrifices made by many, many people. Many people who gave much of their time, talent, and treasure sacrificially so that the church ministries could continue to flourish for the honor and the glory of God. The good work of Bowmansdale that began 125 years ago remains unfinished. But Paul says, he who began a good work in you will what? He will carry it on to completion. That is, God is still at work. The mission still remains. The God-given purposes for this church are unchanged. The work is unfinished. Let us not grow weary, as Paul says, in doing good, for in due season we shall reap a harvest if we faint not. Galatians 6, nine. Friends, I challenge you on this 125th anniversary celebration to keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. You do your part, the Lord will do His part, and you know what? We'll see the kingdom of God continue to grow and multiply for the glory of God. Paul goes on to share just how special this church was to him, and you get a sense of his love for for this congregation, as you read those verses that come then, verses 6 and 7, I believe it is, where he talks about being enchained and, and whether he's defending the gospel or whether he's in prison, he's saying, you're with me in this. You're a partner in this ministry. I, God's grace is, is carrying us through this work together. Keep in mind that Paul is in prison at this time. He's in shackles. But rather than saying, woe is me, what does he talk about? He talks about the grace of God talks about the grace of God. The phrase, because I have you in my heart, really means you are very dear to me. He loves this congregation. You are very dear to me. A few weeks ago, I preached at one of our churches that is undergoing some turmoil. It was not a pleasant experience. Just the week before, they had basically fired their pastor and a asked me to come in and try and calm them down a little bit. And I preached that Sunday and I challenged them to consider the church like Jesus did and, and like Paul did, as the bride of Christ, as something that is beloved and precious. And ask themselves, have they been acting and behaving that way lately? They haven't asked me back to preach, so I'm not sure how that went over. But you get a sense from Paul in verses 7 and 8 that the Philippian church was very precious to him and to our Lord Jesus Christ. And here is the point, Bowmansdale Church of God, as you celebrate your 125th anniversary, remember how precious you are to God. You are special to Him. You are His beloved. You have great value. You are special. You are uniquely called to represent Christ in this community. You are gifted in a way that only God can gift you. You're precious. And as a result, like Paul says, we all share in God's grace with you. 
For over 125 years, God's grace has permeated the Bowmansdale Church of God. So let me challenge you on this anniversary day that you would continue to bloom where you are planted. See, the problem that the church has today, particularly in North America, is that we have a tremendous image problem. A tremendous image problem. To most people, the church isn't very gracious and it isn't very precious. You know the two most common reasons why people don't go to church? Number one, the church is nothing but hypocrites. I heard that when I was pastoring and I always said, well, come on down, we've got room for more. Never seemed to get too many of them. People don't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. And number two, they don't go to church because Christians are always fighting with each other. We have an image problem. We haven't been very grace-filled. So on this anniversary Sunday, let me challenge you to remember the amazing grace of our God who loved us while we were yet sinners. And at the heart of the gospel that's been preached here for 125 years, that God in His amazing grace sent His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross shedding His life's blood for His sins, no, for our sins, so that we might have life, both abundant life and eternal life to come. That's what makes us precious, special, loved. I think we struggle to see ourselves as precious sometimes the life of the church. And we fail to recognize that God has invited us to participate in His redemptive mission. How amazing is that? How wonderful is that? That we have the opportunity to see people move from death to life. To come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. We are a partnership in the gospel ministry with the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes us precious. I love the way one church described itself in an advertisement. It was seeking a new pastor. This was not a church of God, Dr. Mike, so I don't want you to think this is one of ours. But this was this was the advertisement they had placed in a newspaper or a denominational publication looking for a pastor. The ad read this, a diamond in the rough is searching for a master stonecutter to unleash the potential that lies beneath its surface. This gem-to-be can be found in a suburban neighborhood in south-central Pennsylvania. If you have a steady hand, a keen eye, and are willing to strike the blow to produce dazzling results, write to... Isn't that a great advertisement to search for a pastor? Maybe we should try that a little more often, Dr. Mike. What do you think? But isn't that true of every church? True of Bowmansdale Church of God? A diamond in the rough? Precious, loved, special. I'm convinced the church at Philippi was that for Paul. He loved that congregation. He saw them as special, as a diamond in the rough. H.B. London and Mac Wiseman in their book, The Heart of a Great Pastor, say it this way. And in concluding a chapter, they say, this is the time to energize one church, one church at a time, your church. This is a time to pay any price to make ministry so ablaze with God's presence that perplexed, broken people will be drawn to your church and be transformed one at a time. Bloom where God has planted you, Bowmansdale Church of God. You are loved, you are special, you are precious, and may God continue to allow you to further His kingdom both here and throughout the world. Finally, Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more. Now, why does Paul pray this prayer for the church at Philippi? He wants their love to abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. At first reading, you might think, well, that sounds like the same thing, knowledge and depth of insight. But they're really not. What Paul means by knowledge here is the, is the practical knowledge that informs love as the right way or the right means. This is the, the practical things of life. Practical way to love your neighbor as yourself. The practical ways to show God's love day to day, moment to moment. This is the knowledge of what it means to know and follow Jesus. Now the, the phrase, the depth of insight, 
is a less common term, but it refers to moral judgment, of making moral decisions, the correct moral decisions. So essentially, Paul is praying that both their walk and their talk would mirror that of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. I want your walk and your talk to be like Jesus. And he gives three reasons why, if they abound more and more in love, this will benefit them. First, he says that they might discern what is best. We make decisions all the time, don't we? Individually, as families, as a church body. But do we always make the right decisions? No, we don't. Paul is praying that their love would abound more and more so that they would discern what is right, what is best, and make the right decisions. Second, he prays that they might be abound more and more in love so that they might be pure and blameless. Paul says, I want you to make the best choices you can and be the best people you can. He wants their witness and testimony to have power. Be able to draw people to Christ. And lastly, he adds that they'd be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Paul is envisioning a church that looks and acts a whole lot more like Jesus than perhaps we do sometimes. I dare say we have some work to do in this area. So this is not a prayer just for the Philippian church 2,000 years old. This is a prayer for every church today that we would abound more and more in love. And I suspect it's a prayer that's appropriate here for the Bowmansdale Church of God as well. You know, friends, I love the church. I have given my life to the church. But I love Jesus even more. And I love Jesus and all He has done for me. And it's amazing that He invites me, a rather quiet, backward, southern Lancaster County boy, to to be a part of His redemptive mission. But on this anniversary day, as we've been focusing on the body of Christ, let us not forget who is the head of the church. And that's Christ Himself. It is His church. It really is His anniversary. And that's where all praise belongs today. Friends, I want you to listen again to the final verses of this chapter, but this time from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase the message. Verses 9 and 11 from the message. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to live appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Friends, that is your anniversary day challenge, to be that church and oh so much more to the praise and the glory of God. I want to close with one final story. A few years ago now, probably eight to ten years it's been, Dr. Walker preached a very powerful message at our annual conference sessions. It was for our ordination service, and if my memory is correct, it was entitled Press On. That night, Dr. Walker challenged our ordinands to press on in the work of the Lord. That message was based on a passage from Philippians as well, Philippians chapter 3. And so I want the closing words of this challenge today to be from the Apostle Paul, from Dr. Walker, from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself to the Bowmansdale Church of God, that we together we might press on. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal 
to win the prize for which Christ, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Press on, church. The work's not done. Press on that your love may abound more and more. Press on in the partnership of the gospel ministry. Press on because you are precious, the beloved body of Christ. Press on, Bowmansdale Church of God. Press on to the praise and the glory of God. Amen. So be it. Amen. Father, I thank you for 120 years of blessed ministry here in and through the body of Christ, the Bowmansdale Church of God. May they indeed abound more and more in love. And may they press on towards that high calling, the high calling of Jesus Christ. Bless them with many more years of faithful ministry such that even more might come to know Christ as Savior and Lord, be discipled in the faith, and sent forth in mission and ministry in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this time to hear your word and to give you praise for that which you have done and to anticipate that which you will do. We'll trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.